as things continue to feel like they're just getting crazier and crazier all the time in the world around us, in such a relatively short period of time, it struck me the other day to remember that everything we see going on, all the manufactured crises and the media-driven mind control and you know, weaponized identity politics, etc., etc., to remember that all of this is taking place within the context of a society whose most prestigious scholars and institutions have all generations ago embraced the belief that absolutely everything that's happening in the entire history of humanity, the history of life, the history of the earth, the history of the cosmos, all of it is nothing more than the product of a massive explosion billions of years ago. Charles Darwin was not known as a poet, but he rose to a lyrical crescendo in the last paragraph of The Origin of Species. Thus, from the war of nature, from famine and death, the most exalted object which we are capable of conceiving, namely the production of the higher animals, directly follows. There is grandeur in this view of life, with its several powers having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one, and that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. <laughs> Clear-headed as ever, Darwin recognized the moral paradox at the heart of his great theory. He didn't mince words, but he offered the comforting reflection that nature has no evil intentions. Things simply follow from laws acting all around us. To quote an earlier sentence from the same paragraph, he had said something similar at the end of chapter 7 of The Origin. It may not be a logical deduction, but to my imagination, it is far more satisfactory to look at such instincts as the young cuckoo rejecting its foster brothers, ants making slaves, the larvae of ichneumonidae feeding within the live bodies of caterpillars, not as specially endowed or created instincts, but as small consequences of one general law leading to the advancement of all organic beings, namely multiply, vary, let the strongest live and the weakest die. One of the reasons sometimes advanced by historians for Darwin's loss of faith was his revulsion at the cruelty, or rather the callous indifference, of nature. This was not just an incidental fact. Darwin realized that it followed from the theory of natural selection itself. Darwin had a particular thing about the female ichneumon wasp's habit of stinging its victim to paralyze but not kill it, thereby keeping the meat fresh for its larva as it eats the live prey from within. I cannot persuade myself that a beneficent and omnipotent God would have designedly created the ichneumonidae with the express intention of their feeding within the living bodies of caterpillars. As we look back on the history of life, we see a picture of never-ending, ever-rejuvenating novelty. Individuals die, the species, families, orders and even classes go extinct. But the evolutionary process itself seems to pick itself up and resume its recurrent flowering with undiminished freshness with unabated youthfulness as epoch gives way to epoch. The fact of our own existence is almost too surprising to bear. So is the fact that we are surrounded by a rich ecosystem of animals that more or less closely resemble us, by plants that resemble us a little less and on which we ultimately depend for our nourishment, by bacteria that resemble our remoter ancestors and to which we shall all return in decay when our time is past. Darwin was way ahead of his time in understanding the magnitude of the problem of our existence as well as in tumbling to its solution. He was ahead of his time too in appreciating the mutual dependencies of animals and plants and all other creatures in relationships whose intricacy staggers the imagination. How is it that we find ourselves not merely existing but surrounded by such complexity, such elegance, such endless forms, most beautiful, most wonderful. 
It is no accident that we see green almost wherever we look. It is no accident that we find ourselves perched on one tiny twig in the midst of a blossoming and flourishing tree of life. No accident that we are surrounded by millions of other species, eating, growing, rotting, swimming, walking, flying, burrowing, stalking, chasing, fleeing, outpacing, outwitting. Without green plants to outnumber us at least 10 to 1, there would be no energy to power us. Without the ever escalating arms races between predators and prey, parasites and hosts. Without Darwin's war of nature, without his famine and death, there would be no nervous systems capable of seeing anything at all, of appreciating and understanding it.